If I pulled on this red lead, then I would destroy this Formula One car. But what makes this really interesting is that this feature has been on every Formula One car since the 1970s. And at the end of this video, I'll show you what happens when it's pulled. Okay, I think we're good to go. Three, two, one. But why do Formula One cars have this feature? During a Formula One season, it's common to see these drivers having to retire a car from a race when something mechanical breaks down. But like with Carlos Sainz in Austria in 2022, his engine failed and caught fire and started to spread. This then displayed a real world example of why drivers are needing to be able to remove themselves in situations like this. But the FIA who governs all the Formula One rules and regulations won't leave that to chance. Before a driver is allowed to compete in the Formula One World Championship, one of the requirements from the FIA is for you to complete the FIA cockpit exit exercise, also known as the jump test, whereby a driver needs to extract themselves out of a car in seven seconds and then replace the steering wheel back in a total of 12 seconds. And if you can't do this, then you can't race in a championship. So then I wonder how long would it take for an average person with no single seater experience take to get out? And if they can complete it within the allotted time? Well, we're about to find out. For the test today, we are using Sergio Perez's 2019 Racing Point. And special thanks again to TDF for helping with this and for helping me set off a fire extinguisher safely at the end of the video. But when a driver does have a crash, we see them return the steering wheel back into the cockpit. So why is that? Well, one reason is because not many people know how to put a steering wheel back onto a Formula One car, which also includes the marshals. But it also means if the marshals can move the car without needing a crane, they can easily control the front wheel's rotation to make their job much easier. Easier. And let's not also forget that the wheels are very expensive. So leaving it back in the car's cockpit means that the teams, F1 and the FIA can view the live onboard to make sure no one with sticky fingers can get their hands on it, as opposed to a driver walking off with it and it suddenly gets lost. Are the pedals in? No. Uh, I was just thinking like, yeah. like, there's a lot of travel here. <laughs> and on top of that, a few years ago, it was also said that the marshals could put the car back into neutral. But because the wheels have become a bit more complex and differ from team to team, the marshals can now put the car into neutral from the outside of the cockpit. Cockpit. So if a driver doesn't disengage the clutch, it could be done by using the switch here. There's only special circumstances where a driver doesn't need to replace the wheel back into the cockpit and that's when the car becomes unsafe. Whether that's through obvious danger like a fire breakout or a crash being that significant, but also if there is an electrical issue. And an example of this was back in 2019 at the Bahrain GP. Daniel Ricciardo had to retire his car due to his car's energy recovery system alert light turning red, which means that the car is electronically unsafe. Now, during in this exercise, you are allowed to pass a steering wheel to a team member and they can return it to you, but the headrest must stay on the car at all times. The exercise begins with the driver already in the car and fully connected. This includes your radio system, all of the seatbelts fastened up tightly, the headrest on and the steering wheel in place. And all race wear is needed for this too, including your race boots, race underwear, race suits, balaclava, gloves, hands or FHR device, and of course, your helmet. But for today's test, I won't be wearing a hands device and I won't be having the headrest in. And this is purely just so then I don't accidentally damage the car, like cracking the headrest, making it unusable. So then how long does it take for a regular person who doesn't have any single seater experience to take to do the test? Three, two, one. Ah. Centino. <laughs> Oh, I didn't even get the wheel back up. Yeah, that's in my hand. <laughs> but to be fair though, it is the first time I've ever climbed into a real life F1 car. But it looks like I won't be driving one soon because I can't safely get out in time. However, one way I am keeping myself safe whenever I'm traveling to make these videos is using today's sponsor, Surfshark VPN. Now Surfshark VPN keeps your online identity safe by encrypting all of the information being sent between your device and the internet. This means your personal data is protected from big companies or cyber criminals. And this includes when you're using public Wi-Fi, which is what I regularly do when I'm making these videos in a hotel room. But by far my favorite feature is that their VPN service can digitally change your location to another to help you access TV shows and films which are restricted in your own country. So if you're in the UK but you're visiting abroad and wanting to watch shows back on the BBC iPlayer, you can digitally change your location back to the UK to access those shows. But Surfshark VPN isn't just limited to folk like us in the UK, Surfshark has over 3,000 servers across 100 countries, meaning you can unlock even more geoblock programs and services in different territories. And if you use my promo code MATAMIS, you'll get an extra three months 
for free. So click the link in the description below to find out more. But what's the point of doing this exercise in the first place? Drivers climb in and out of these cars hundreds of times during a season. Why does it need to be timed? And why do all the drivers need to return the steering wheel? Well, the whole point of this is all around safety. Doing this exercise gives the FIA confidence that the driver has the physical strength to remove themselves from a car when they're in serious danger. But let's move on to why it's needing to be timed. Seven seconds to just get out of the car and to put the steering wheel back on in a total of 12 seconds. Now, originally, this used to be a total of 12 seconds with five seconds to remove yourself from the cockpit, but this was changed when the Halo device came into the championship. But the time duration here is more related to the amount of protection you get from the car and from the driver's race suit. The regulations state that a driver's race suit must be resistant to fire to up to 12 seconds to allow the driver enough time to extract from the accident and away from receiving any further damage. But the car itself can also momentarily protect the driver in the case of a fire with its built-in fire extinguisher. Now this big E indicates the kill switch for the electric circuit breaker, which all Formula 1 cars have. Once the cable is pulled, it moves the cable inside and switches everything off. That way there is no risk of an electric shock to either the drivers or to the marshals. And this red lead can be pulled either externally or with a button on the inside in the driver's cockpit. But it also activates the onboard extinguisher. Now once activated, it releases a fire extinguisher liquid into the driver's cockpit and also underneath the engine covers. And this type of fire extinguisher is made to not back the flames and again aiding the driver to be able to get out quickly. And a quick side note, if you want to learn more about the fire marshal training and the different extinguishers they use on a typical race weekend, then I've linked a previous video of mine at the very end of this video. Now you might think that with all the safety implementations Formula 1 have introduced in the most recent years, you might think that this jump test was introduced fairly recently. But this rule was in the regulations way before the Halo device was introduced. It actually came into action back in 1971. Like seriously, it's listed right here in the regulation books from over 50 years ago saying the maximum time necessary for the driver to get in or out does not exceed five seconds. So once they've been pulled or the driver's pressed the button to set it off, the extinguisher normally has nozzles. You'll have at least one or two in the cockpit to suppress for the driver. And then generally you'll have a couple the other side of the bulkhead firing into the engine bay. Obviously most fires tend to come from hot exhausts or oil lines or that sort of thing in the back. So it just helps suppress everything in there. So then what does it look like when extinguisher goes off? Well, I brought this single seater extinguisher for 500 pounds to show you. Now this large canister isn't what you would normally get in a Formula One car. It actually looks like this, but the price will jump from 500 pounds upwards to seven to 8,000. Pounds. And the reason for the price jump is due to a few different factors. It used to be Halon back in the day, which is now uh, banned <laughs> for multiple reasons. It's sort of somewhere between a water type extinguisher and a powder extinguisher. So it's made up of various chemicals. It's not the nicest fluid to be on anything. It does bubble away, but it's also designed that it won't just evaporate. But the extinguisher does tend to eat away over a period of time. So you can save some components, but they need to be off the car and looked after quite quickly. Extinguishers in Formula One cars are are generally made of carbon fiber, um, unlike a normal metallic big extinguisher that you might see in an office or something. And they are generally molded and shaped to the chassis. So the teams are obviously looking to save as much weight as possible. The extinguisher really is quite a heavy thing that you want to hide away in the smallest space you can. So although they're all by regulation, they have to have a certain amount of extinguishing. Common places always in the chassis around the driver so that no matter what happens with an accident, they're generally going to be in the safest place and they run on their own electronic system. So they will go off no matter what's happened to the rest of the car. Under the driver's legs or under their kidneys is also quite a good spot because there's enough space in the chassis to be able to, to put them there. This is out of a 1999 car. Um, it was shaped to sit in the chassis underneath the driver's legs, hence the, the shaping in it. This sort of era, they'd all move to a remote charge. A lot of like extinguishers that you see in an office are obviously all charged vessels. These are remote charged. So in here is all the fluid and the extinguishing that you need to go around the car in light of saving weight, making it easier to change because these generally get buried quite a lot. They have a remote charge that is normally nitrogen and that will sit in a separate part of the car. And when you press the button, that charge releases, puts all its pressure into here and then forces all the extinguishing out to go where it needs to in the car. So this is out of a 2012 car. And again, we've obviously got newer systems than that, but they all follow the same procedures really and what they're trying to do. FEV are generally the people that do most of the grid, if not all of the grid now. And these are all designed by the team to fit in some quite complicated shapes. So this, this would sit in the Sauber down underneath your kidneys, a lot lighter, a lot stronger with the way the carbon fiber technology has gone on and the way they can bond carbon and titanium together. There's, there is a piece that goes in the top of this that has the filler and the two necks that come out that the extinguishing comes out but essentially this is a sealed system inside with a, a rubber bag a little bit like a, a little bit like the fuel tank and the separate charge when it does go off that's got 
an amount of pressure. Um, it varies depending on the series. And the pressure finds its way inside here and the only way that it can get everything out is then to force all the fluid out because you try, try to replace the fluid with the pressure and that forces all the fluid out down the nozzles and then to all the various places in the car that it's plumbed to. Now my goal for my YouTube channel is to show you how Formula One works and I'm nearly at 100,000 subscribers so if you are new here and you want to learn more about it then make sure to click subscribe. Thanks ever so much for watching, I hope you did enjoy this and I'll see you next time.